What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook. And I'm the Blade. And I'm the Elegant Design. <laughs> and, and together, together we're, we're, you, you know. know. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the White Hook Wolfcast, a show about all things river raids. I'm your host, Lawson, joined by your host, Tim, as well as the Elegant Design herself, White Wolf Whispers. Hello, hello, hello. The standard gentleman hook made. Just to get this out of the way, Tim, is there anything you need to tell us about home fries? Uh, like how you've eaten so many home fries? <laughs> Don't do any more than four potatoes at once. <laughs> I learned this the hard way. How many days in a row have you just been eating home fries? I think this is day four. It's just breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snack, I, I, and <laughs> midnight snack. Yeah, and... I eat I eat a home fried granola bar for for my snack. Um, <laughs> no, I've 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 been I've usually been making eight potatoes a day, so four in like when I wake up and four before I go to bed. That's a lot of potato. It's just, it's potato. just kind of uh, I don't know. I'm just I've been on a, I've been on a home fry kick. Whenever I, I found the perfect method for a quesadilla, I couldn't stop making quesadillas. It's just, I don't know. And so now I just can't stop making home fries <laughs> until I ultimately get bored of them. I think all of us out there listening to this can relate to that experience of I eating know. eight potatoes per day. <laughs> What's less exciting <laughs> is just before recording, I dunked my uh, one half of my earbuds into my drink. <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm super worried that I'm going to get fucking electrocuted in the middle of recording. You, you got to keep your earbuds in your ears where they belong, my guy. If we hear you just like shout all of a sudden. Yeah, just, if you're like, fuck. Yeah, we'll keep going. Don't worry. Yeah. We'll call 911, but we'll keep recording. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We make we'll sure we're going. safe. Yeah, the, yeah, that yeah. works. Yeah, don't worry. You're not going to get electrocuted. I don't think there's enough current flowing through a pair of earbuds to like shock somebody. I think you'd be all right. I might be talking about my ass. Any electricians out there, feel free to comment. But I do feel like I know a bit about the subject just because, like, I spent my entire childhood being deathly afraid of electrocution. I don't know why. It was, like, my main fear. I, uh, my, <laughs> my, my parents had bought me when I was, like, I was, like, three. They bought me this really badass wall-mounted multi-disc CD player. It had, like, LED lights on it. It looked fucking cool. And it was purely for me to, like, listen to Kids Bop with. <laughs> And uh, like I could put a different Kids Bop CD in each of the slots. So I could <laughs> Any just slot? Hot swap Kids Bop. It would be great. So you had Kids Bop three, four, five, six all loaded oh, up yeah. ready to go? Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. And I started like I just I I started reading the manual that came with the CD thing, and there was <laughs> there was like a warning on the first page that said like you know, it's like your standard warning of like don't get it wet, like don't drop it in the bathtub. Don't put it in your mouth. You'll get electrocuted. And I was overcome with fear immediately that like I would just be sleeping and like it would start raining and the presence of water in the uh, adjacent to my house would Are like Are you sleeping outside? No. <laughs> no. I was sure that the CD player was going to like shock me to death in my sleep. <laughs> it's it's funny how much how much just real estate in your in, in your home and how much technology goes into or used to go into just playing CDs and that technology yeah. is completely obsolete now. It's, it's yeah. incredible. No, my parents were upset though. Cause that thing was not cheap and I, I was too afraid to even have it in my room anymore. So they had to get rid of it. <laughs> they just put it in their car. I think they just sold it. <laughs> I don't remember, but I've never lived that down. They're still upset about it. I bet it'd be pretty dope if you, if you could play the Tron soundtrack on, on one of those things. Oh, I have it on vinyl. I can do that now. The Tron Ooh, soundtrack. Ooh, vinyl. You get lots of really cool things on vinyl. Vinyl's overrated. I, I oh. like vinyl just as like a collector thing. I don't even have a record player. A collector, player. exactly. I not to play any of my vinyls. I, I just, those like <laughs> shitty $30 record players that you can buy with that are like half suitcase, half record player. They're not like, they're not going to work properly. You need like a really expensive one for it to actually hear the difference. I feel like, I don't know, maybe not. Well, yeah, it's the, it's the needle. You yeah, need a really good needle. Gotta have a good needle. Don't we all? <laughs> Speaking of good needles, and, and by that I mean not related to this at all. Um, I got 
I, I, I had to, I, I feel like I need to update you guys on something real quick. Uh, this is just going to be something I wanted to talk about real quick on the show. I, uh, okay. I, I went to the doctor and I got some tests done. And right before we started recording this, I got a call from, from my doctor and he said, listen, Lawson, I, I have bad news. You have unspent sync points. <laughs> <gasps> that is so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly thought, like, I was, I, like, for a second, I was like, wait, I thought we were talking about river raids. What the fuck is, what are you talking about, Lawson? Did you I get know, some I bad th- news? I thought, I thought that, too. Lawson, <laughs> are you going to be sick for another two months? <laughs> Dude, I, I'm, maybe, I don't know. I just know that I have unspent sync points and there's nothing they can do about it. That's funny because a lot, a lot of times I'll see it on, on the screen as unsync spent points. <laughs> and I'll say it backwards every single time. Unsync spent points. Unsync spent points. <laughs> That'd be a worse call yeah. to get from my doctor, I think. <laughs> well, it's not. It's just like it's just like Valhalla. You have all those stupid mastery points Ugh. or your your skill level points just hanging up there on the screen just all the time, chilling in the fucking upper right hand corner for no reason. <laughs> God damn! <laughs> it's like I know how many skill points I, I have. I have them. I'm not about to spend them. So <laughs> throw the fuck away. <laughs> but I mean, the Unity one's more offensive because it'll give you that pop up even when you don't have enough sync points to spend them on anything to spend it on anything yeah i have two fucking sync points i can't buy anything with that <laughs> exactly it's like why is this here <laughs> but uh yeah i did i did want to mention river raids wolfie have you done have you done any river raids uh yeah i i have completed the first two maps oh wow uh, i've got most all of the black flag stuff of course yeah i've got the last map to finish up i pretty much couldn't do it for very long like i I did uh, a bit of it. I did a couple runs and I was like, oh yeah, this is just the whole, this is it. This is all there's going to be. Yeah. I grabbed the, the Jackdaw shields or whatever. I grabbed the, Gross. Mm-hmm. the, the sail, but that's, um, yeah, <laughs> can't do it. It's too, it's too shitty. Tim, uh, do you remember when we were talking about like, Hey, wouldn't it be great if when you're doing these like raids, you know, in the game, in the base game in, in England, well in Eastern England, whatever the fuck <laughs> Noah, um, <laughs> you, <laughs> you you know we were talking about how like if there was like any sort of gameplay element of like having to keep your crew protected or like they die but it doesn't matter because you can just you know like they're nobodies and there's like yeah there's no crew management there was no like gameplay uh system it was just a place where you go and you do combat and then you yes. do things right so they they said what if we actually did implement a system that added gameplay to that experience and so you have like a crew of eight Yom's Viking that they have health bars. They can die in battle and be retired. You can loot things that are that you can use to like customize your shit. Uh, what if we what if we actually made that a form of gameplay and then we relegated it to a completely external mode of gameplay separate from the actual main world where you have to like build a special building in your hut and then go on river raids through different rivers in in Western England and it's completely extraneous. And all that you'll get for wasting your time on this is like, I don't know. I think there's an armor set. I think that's it. A little bit of supplies. A little bit of supplies. Wow. And now a whole external marketplace for shit through that building that you can only get the resources for by doing river raids. So it's kind of like a tiny mobile game has been affixed to the thigh of Assassin's Creed Valhalla surgically. And it's just there now being awful yeah it has nothing to do with the story yeah it has absolutely nothing to do with the story and i don't i don't even use them i I'll, I'll go to a location i'll go to a place i'll leave my boys on board the ship yeah i'll run in i'll run in kill everybody myself mm-hmm. and then and only then when everybody's dead yeah then i'll you know sound the horn bring everybody in so i can finish looting and then i'm done going on to the next place yeah yeah and it sounds pretty awful it's pretty dog shit <laughs> It's kind of repetitive. Rates. It was kind of fun at first, but yeah, it, it got it's it's a little repetitive. You you describe it like when I just hear river raids and like when you first were describing it, I I was kind of like, like wow, interesting. So anyone that buys this game post river raids are now going to have raids on the waterways in which you take to get to different locations. That's not even what it is. It's just a, it's no. Ugh, okay, it feels <laughs> weirdly redundant to me on the level that like river raids are something you can do in the base game that that exist in the world and have since launch but now there is a river raids mode that has its own 
map, its own currency, its own Gross. gameplay systems. So am I doing a river raid or am I doing a river raid? You know what I mean? Like, what's going on? It's pretty fucked up. Valhalla <laughs> keeps getting worse. But we are not here to talk about Valhalla. We are here to talk about unspent sync points. Yes. First question uh, for for both of you. Unity. Love it or hate it? Love it. Hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle, but I'm leaning towards hate it. <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle, though. I kind of, I'm mixed. Um, you love it, Wolfie? I do. I do. I very much do. Where does it compare? I know Black Flag is your favorite, but where does Unity stack up? In my ranking, uh, it's around three or four. <laughs> what's what's between Black Flag and Unity? Brotherhood and possibly Revelations. Uh, okay. Revelations and Unity kind of flip-flop back and forth. I'm gotcha. good with the Revelations, but Brotherhood being there? what What, what is happening? Yep. <laughs> people love brotherhood man yeah for yep. like i i it, it's like it's like mass hysteria like <laughs> how does how do so many people just love brotherhood without realizing that it's not that great i, I if i had to guess i'd say it's like technically the most like it's like ac2 but more polished so if you love that gameplay style yes you like the polish yes it's just i can't get past the redundant storyline and the sameness of it every year people do like a thread or a video about how like brotherhood is 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 like this masterpiece in the series and it's it's like <laughs> when are people going to discover that it isn't <laughs> one day one day we'll have our <laughs> reckoning timothy we'll show the non-believers <laughs> well, well let me ask you this do you love this game despite its flaws or do you think it is not flawed Oh, it's definitely flawed. Okay. Oh, it's definitely flawed. <laughs> yeah, it has a lot of control issues. It has a lot of... Uh, Arno is very sticky. Yeah. He's very, he sticks to everything. He's like Spider-Man. Yeah, and, and uh, snipers, they can see through walls. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It has a lot of jank. It has a lot of wonkiness, but there's a lot of other things that I can look past all that. Gotcha. I kind of, I feel where you're coming from because for, I would say like the first half of the game as I was playing it on this playthrough, which was my first time playing through it from the beginning with a new save file all the way through, because I, after the yeah. first time I played it, every other replay I've done, which there have been like two or three, maybe has just been going through the memories, like in the tracker, yeah. which is a little yeah. bit different. Yeah. Cause you don't get all the cutscenes when you do it that way. Yeah. And you, yeah, you, you don't have to deal with like the economy or the customization so much if you do it that way too, Yeah, which has its positives. But <laughs> I felt like for the first half of playing this game, like I was like, the game was janky, but I felt all of a sudden for the first time in my life that I was like speaking the language of the jank. I was speaking jank fluently while playing Unity. Like <laughs> I just knew where it was going to be. I expected it. I could deal with it. I could predict it and, yeah. and work around you it. You knew how to control it. Yeah. yeah. And it just felt like, okay, this is, this is not bad. This is pretty good. But as the game goes on, it just gets progressively jankier. The mission designs hold together like less well over time. And that second half is full of moments where I was like, experiencing that classic unity frustration of wanting to throw my controller out the damn window. <laughs> so, so I get I where you're coming you. from. I hear you. Yeah. Tim, uh, how is this playthrough compared to, to some of your previous ones? If you've had any, uh, well, <laughs> I haven't, this is my first time playing it through since launch. Yeah. So I, I played it when it came out, and then uh, I was that, that was it. I was satisfied. Didn't want to do it again. So this is my second playthrough from beginning to end. I couldn't wait for it to end. Oh. <laughs> it was pretty much like my experience with AC3. Like, yeah. I just could not wait. Like, I played more of it so that I could, did not, I, it, it would mean less days of having to play it. Well, here's the thing. There's a lot about Unity that... I want to like, okay. And there's a lot about Arno. Like to me, Arno is like, I don't know. It feels like the Assassin's Creed character that like should be my favorite. Okay. And I feel like they dropped the ball, but there's so much about Arno that I do really like, but there's equally amount of things I don't like. And so ultimately like, I don't like Arno and I don't, he doesn't, he doesn't pop up even on my top five of 
AC characters. Yeah. And there's a lot about just like conceptually. And, and it's like, I don't even think he's like, I know a lot of the like criticism early on was that like, oh, he's just an Ezio clone. I don't think so. No. No, um, no I've never thought that either. There's, there's nothing like, sure, he's a young, brash kid, pretty much, you know, and he's like getting, the, yeah. getting himself into trouble, but that's it. Like, he's not Ezio. And honestly, going through this playthrough, like, the okay up until the title sequence i think the the unity intro up until when you start the game you, you hit the helix thing and then up into the title sequence is pretty great ultimately i disagree I, I i'm not even saying that like I, I i love the like two dead dad shit or whatever i'm just saying like yeah there's something about the tone that is seems to be like hitting its mark mm-hmm. but i, I don't want to get too far away from arno specifically i guess but when I was playing this and 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 I and I was seeing the you know like the Templar Codex and he was putting it in the ground and everything like there was just something about the tone of this game that at this very moment it's 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 perfect you know what I mean yeah it's unmatched it didn't stick throughout which kind of speaks to how this game is kind of like kind of feels like on a story level like you know a Frankenstein Assassin's Creed experience because there's just so much yeah. it just feels like stitched together body parts wolfie how do you feel about arno i adore arno um (laughs) i don't know if i don't know if it's just because he needs a lot of help and i i find myself wanting to help him (laughs) yeah he has he has abandonment issues (laughs) and yeah i just you know i just i just want to give him a hug tell him it's going to be okay (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> as as Dan Janot said, I mean Arno's damaged goods. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, we're hitting on something that I really noticed about Arno in this playthrough. I liked Arno considerably less on this playthrough than I ever have in the past. Uh, Aww, mainly, poor Arno, because I feel like he's not a very active protagonist. In typically in a story, you know, like uh, well, let's compare it to say Ezio. Once Ezio puts on the assassin outfit, he's in control of the narrative, at least as far as we, the audience, are concerned. Of course, there is the later reveal that like, oh, all of his friends were helping him out, part of the assassins, but that doesn't really take away from his agency. He puts the suit on. He learns how to do things. He carries out the assassinations. They're all very deliberate choices that that he's making. And Arno, to an extent, yes, he's making choices. Usually, you know, in in many cases, as we know, they're against what the Brotherhood wants him to do. But it always feels like he's just pursuing the like last lead that he's received without ever really questioning any of the information he gets or making choices on any line of of logic other than what's going to get me to avenging Delacere. Right. He's not putting the pieces together himself. Yeah. He just stumbles upon a, a piece of the puzzle and he's like, well, guess I'm going to go kill this guy. There are scenes where, where he talks to the, the Brotherhood and they're like, well, this is what you should do, Arno. And he's like, okay. And then he leaves and he goes, <laughs> has coffee with Elise. And Elise is like, actually, this is what you should do, Arno. And he's like, well, okay. <laughs> and I just never feel like I'm doing what Arno wants to do. I feel like I'm doing what other people want Arno to do. And there's never a moment in the story where he clicks into being active and, and shaping the, the narrative as opposed to just reacting to it. And that just feels like bad writing to me. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, very, yeah, very much. He's, he's just like Marquis de Sade. He's like, well, hey, yeah. you, should, you, you should go here and do this. And he's like, okay. <sighs> All right, I guess. <laughs> All right, I, I, I guess. I might as All well. right, I guess. All right. And then, you know, it's like, and it's like it's a symptom of i think a bigger problem too where i i i would like to pose this argument okay here's my here's my hot arno take are you ready uh arno is not a character (laughs) arno arno is not a character arno is a plot device i think that every single thing arno ever says or does has is so transparently for the sake of moving the plot in a particular direction that he never has like the, the very base elements that make someone a character in my opinion, like you have to have a consistent, you know, motivation. You have to have a consistent ideological framework. You have to typically have certain assumptions about the world that, that stay the same that, or that, that, that are challenged or changed by the narrative. I just don't, I don't think Arno is any more of a character than any of the, like, 
one note motherfuckers on the Brotherhood Council. He's just not he's not a character. I don't know if anyone's well, a character in this story except maybe Elise. You're touching on something that I think is the biggest problem with Unity. And yeah. it's that Arno the expectation out of a assassin templar love story is not that they are just like putty and they're constantly like move like or at least Arno is and he's constantly being molded and crafted into whatever Elise wants him to or the brotherhood wants him to in that moment as you were saying you know so the the expectation that's set out when you are doing an assassin templar either love story or just team up type of story is that there's going to be the ideological challenges and they're going to have to work through that somehow. Yeah. The biggest problem with unity is that they don't do that. Or that they'll have to be working cross purposes to each other. But since Arno's only like actual concrete goal at any point in the story is to avenge Delacere, he's never at cross purposes with Elise. They're always on the same ex- side. Yes. Ex- yes. Very. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you hit it exactly. Cause it's not like Arno's, goal in the world is to rid the templars out of paris right he is he and so and and but that would create a conflict with elise because oh, she's a templar yeah so that would be like, interesting <laughs> right yeah because it's like oh shit i actually i don't i don't want to kill elise but that's kind of what i've sworn to do and so his main goal is just i want revenge i want to avenge delacere and that's it and so what that leaves us is arno's an assassin when he needs to be and Arno's not an assassin when he needs to be. It, it just, you should have these conversations between Arno and Elise where they are at odds. And they, are, they should be so stubbornly assassin and Templar. And it's funny because you could kind of suggest, well, Elise is true to herself. Elise is a Templar. Not really. She doesn't have any <laughs> Templar allies. She is nothing. Right. She is constantly without allies. And she's also fighting other Templars. She's exactly. not fighting... Yeah assassins you know what i mean her whole her whole goal whole, in the game the, is to is to, is to kill <laughs> germa another templar like yeah she's hard she so yeah. she's not even true to herself anyway the whole i think i think that they've really tried to present the peace between assassins and templars by making it so that arno isn't always an assassin and elise isn't always a templar i mean she is a Templar, but the whole coup has basically destroyed anybody that she could have had as an ally. Yeah. So she doesn't have anybody left. Right. And she's not a threat. Except for Yeah, and, and that makes her not a threat. Also, what you're hitting on, Wolfie, that I think also weakens the, the sort of narrative effectiveness of the story, is that the whole thing is very mired in this political situation with assassins and Templars. And I never feel like the the weight of that situation or the the context for that situation is very well communicated. C- correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel like, uh, you know, in that first mission where you are at the party and you can hear all these conversations, you know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah. The Templars are there. Yeah. The Templars Absolutely are there. You can there. hear them talking. I feel like I can hear Mirabeau and Delacere talking about, we well, should have a truce. Well, that's at the, um, that's at the, Oh, what is it called? The, the convention or when, Arno is running from Victor and Hugo. Yeah. He over he overhears Mirabeau and uh, De La Serre. Is that the moment the truce begins, or am I misinterpreting? No, I think that they've been working on it for a while. Okay. I think they've been working on it. For, it's just Arno overheard the word truce, and, I mean, again, at that point, he didn't even know Assassin Templars at yeah, all. Yeah, he was like, fuck you guys, <clears throat> I'm going to go get some pussy. <laughs> 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 I'm just thinking, like, we're supposed to understand that the murder of, of Delacere is the moment that it goes to shit because if the Grand Master of the Templars has been murdered, then this truce may be up in flames, so to speak. If right. we are no longer aligned with someone who we, you know, we could trust, then then maybe th- there's no truce. And that should be like a big deal, but I feel like one that that little conversation you over here indicates it's not like they've been in the state of peace for maybe even longer than a day. <laughs> if that's you know, if that's when they're hammering it out finally, and then he gets murdered at the same time, I, I don't I don't get that part. I don't get how avenging that murder is even really in the interests of the Brotherhood themselves. 
per se. Well, I, uh, I, I don't I, know why they care. I think the idea is that they don't know that there is this kind of like rift between the Templars. And so they feel like if they avenge his death, then perhaps the good Templars will still be at truce with them. It's it's sloppy. It's clunky. Well, that's the other thing, too, is Mirabeau is the only one who wants this. The rest of the council doesn't give a fuck. So it's only right. Mirabeau. It's only it's, Mirabeau. The whole story is built on this very this very complex interfactional politics that I feel like never comes across as well as it should. Right. Yeah. For it to be justifying so much of the narrative. And there's so there's there's such an unsatisfying element to like all the assassinations because it's not like Arno is there because he hates Templars. He's on autopilot. The whole the, the whole time is on yeah. autopilot because like, oh, whatever will make Elise love me again, you know, and <laughs> it's such a wasted opportunity for a story like this, because I feel like you could tell a story where it's like, wow, their love is so powerful that it bridges a divide between the Templars and assassins. Holy shit. Or ultimately it doesn't. <laughs> right. But yeah. I, I, it's, it's so disappointing because with having Elise like orphaned from the Templars and Arno being kicked out, you know, they're both they're both like they're both homeless to their respective factions and so that's not a truce a truce between who <laughs> two people who don't who aren't who don't represent their individual groups you know what i mean as far right. as the templars of paris yeah. are concerned elise is a is a bitch you know like <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> they don't like her <laughs> yeah yeah they want her dead yeah. <laughs> no i mean you're right and there's also the whole like mystery structure that they that they aim for where the idea is each time Arno kills somebody, you get a piece of the story, you get a piece of the puzzle, or at least you understand why that person was like culpable. But like the, the that structure prevents as you just and I this is something I only just realized. We don't care when Arno has to go kill a guy because the only thing we have to go on that we're killing X, Y, Z person is because we've seen them say something weird in like the last victim's memories. And typically we're not understanding the full extent of their responsibility until we see their memories when we kill them. So we're literally not getting the full story for why we should kill this person until after we kill this person. Well, that also that's also true with uh, with the murder of Lafreniere. I'm sorry, I don't yeah, speak yeah. French, so I'm going to kill these. <laughs> Arno shouldn't yeah. have killed him. And, right. Um, yes. He didn't, he didn't know that. She That guy is on Elise's side and Elise, uh, Elise hears like, there should be a conflict between Arno and Elise that Arno just fucking stabbed him. There's no conversation yeah. about it. Oh shit, you just killed my last ally in France? <laughs> right on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he didn't know that until after he had killed him and then saw his memories that, yeah, he was trying yeah, to save I, him. Yeah, I, I know. I'm just saying, like, Elise should have reason to be mad at Arno because he just killed the only person who could probably help Elise. Yeah, exactly. And something that I've often criticized about the game, I've made this point many times in like Reddit posts, conversations, what have you. I've always said that like, it's a bad idea to make the villain of your story, like make, make who the villain is a mystery. Uh, if you still want to have that sort of villain hero relationship where there's like a big showdown at the end and you fight the villain and, and it's dramatic. Like if you want to do that, don't make it a mystery. I do think though, when I, when I replayed, like they almost, they almost do it well in the sense that they follow the typical mystery convention of like in any mystery story, the ultimate culprit is someone you've already met and that they do well. Like we meet Germain, he's a, he's a silversmith and he seems like he's just caught up in this. And maybe if there were other like compelling candidates for like, oh, that person could be the culprit. That person could be the culprit. Like if, if Arno was actually following leads in, in the traditional mystery sense and not just as a plot motivation to get him to kill the next person on the list, then it would have worked out maybe really well. M many other Assassin's Creed stories after have done the same thing, but even worse, like Origins and Odyssey both have mystery villains that you end up being completely meaningless. And, and so I give... I give Unity a bit of retroactive credit for that. No, the end, the end of Origins with the the big bad villain. Yeah. No, no. It's a joke. <laughs> they, straight up. That, yeah. Yeah, I completely yeah. agree, Loss. And it's like if if only there were other people that you met throughout the game that were yeah. actually candidates for being the villain, Suspects. because because it's like there's everyone else you're slaughtering. Eventually, you're gonna get to the fucking prison. And <laughs> I, I want to go back to something you said. 
uh, Lawson, you were talking about each time he, he kills someone, he gets a little bit uh, a piece of the mystery. Yeah. It's it's almost laughable how literal yeah. the assassins are just taking Arno's eagle sense visions. Like, yeah, I don't know what was up like, with literally, that. Literally, he's like, he's <laughs> like, there's another, there's another piece to this puzzle. Someone else ordered De La Serra's I murder. I looked through his memories. Uh, uh, what are you basing that off of, Arno? Oh, well, when I killed him, I saw a vision of it. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Like, literally, <laughs> he says explicitly in a scene, he's like, when I, when I went through his memories. Uh, what? Hello? Excuse me. You did what now, Arno? Wait, Arno, I thought you were basing this off of, like, empirical data you found. No. Like, uh, evidence. I went through his memories. <laughs> <laughs> sifted through like a file <laughs> oh my god yeah and also can, like the obvious thing is that it's the laziest way to do a mystery story <laughs> where literally just killing a person gives you the evidence <laughs> like you don't actually have to look for it you never have to put thought into what that evidence is how it gets left somewhere yeah. how how it gets found <laughs> the way that a mystery normally does Arno's just fucking throwing darts on a map. He's just like, all right, well, let me kill you and see if you did it. <laughs> and they're like, stop killing people. We don't ask you to. And he's like, no, <laughs> never. I need to, I need to find out the, who killed Dennis there. I think the moment that really, that really clinches my assessment of Arno for me is uh, there's, there's, there's nothing that makes me want to turn this game off more than drunk Arno. I fucking hate the entire drunk Arno <laughs> section because there's not a single ounce of any anything in my body that believes on any level that Arno cares so deeply about anything he's involved in, be it the Brotherhood or or his Elise drama, that like what he's gonna do now is get shit faced and go on a week long bender. Like none of that makes sense to me. I don't think that's believable on any metric for who Arno theoretically supposedly is as a character. Which just tells me, like, yeah, this is the part where the writers said we need like a a, a mid a, a mid a third act low point. We need, we need all to seem lost because that's how stories usually work. Let's just have him get drunk, go on a bender. Yeah, we don't need to do anything interesting with him. Oh, see, I I, I disagree with that. Okay, I yeah I I actually like the <laughs> the bender scene. No, I like the um. Because as he's going through the palace, he's he's seeing old memories of uh, basically a, is a happier time in his life. Yeah. Of course, he sees he sees he sees his dad, and then he sees you know Elise, and the the whole scene where he's you know following Elise through the party. Um, I just see I just see it as Arno that that's really his low point. He's Elise basically has told him she doesn't want him around. He's like fine. I'll just go. He's been thrown out of the Brotherhood. Fine, I'll just go. Again, it's abandonment issues. He's feeling sorry for himself. He's He doesn't know what else he can do. And he goes and he gets drunk. And then it's only after the um, after he loses his dad's watch and he has the whole fight with the, with the guy who, the soldier who stole his watch, and Elise shows back up again. And he's basically like, what do you want? You only come around when you want something. So he's he's feeling pretty low. I do like that that while he's drunk, there's there is that whole playable sequence where he's like, I really need wine, so he kills twelve people <laughs> <laughs> to get some wine. I he know that's really just, needed his wine. That's just how these games work, but it was pretty funny. Like, yeah, you know, it's like I did I, I appreciated Arno like being like, oh, you must want something because it's like, oh, wow. Actually, Arno is actually speaking for himself. Oh, but then character conflict. Then, That's interesting and cool. <laughs> but, then, but then immediately he's like, all right, let's go to France, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he kind of does go straight from like, you're just using me to like, well, I know you're just using me, but let's go. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> let's have a fun time. And it's like, uh, again, so like oh, your mom. Uh, who, who let him keep his assassin gear? <laughs> oh, no, no. Fuck off. Here's your phantom blade. Good night. Like. How does he end up being an assassin again at the end anyway? We don't get to see that. No, we don't. And that's yeah, very and disappointing. It's like that whole time that he's drunk and, and on a week-long bender, his assassin gear is just in a trunk somewhere. <laughs> oh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay. I just think like on a storytelling level, it's like 
the the assassins as a concept don't matter much to Arno's character. Like, it's not really part of his arc that he, you know, joins them or that he eventually rejoins right. and becomes a master assassin. Like, none of that is speaking to any character transformation that we yeah. can see. It's purely about, well, we need that to happen at the end of this game yeah. so that it seems like there was an arc. But they're not actually earning. He's that not arc. even a true assassin at all. Even when he's inducted, he's just there because it's it's a means to an end. And Wolfie, yeah. to your point, I do think that the him being ousted from the Brotherhood could have been a moment where he's like he realizes his fuckery and perhaps uses that to grow. But he's he's ousted and he's just like he just kind of looks at it like they're like the they just don't understand, you know, like he's just misunderstood. And that to me is a very yeah. self centered way to look at it, look at it. And he so deserved to be kicked out. <laughs> like he did. Yeah, he totally did. There were three, I think, three assassination missions you go through where he <laughs> never once went to the council and said, yeah. "You know, this is what I found out." Yeah, he's the worst yeah. assassin. Yeah, he's he, the worst. And they're like, you know, if you it. if you assassinate people without our permission, that just basically makes you a murderer. So <laughs> you are just a guy that murders yeah. people. Yeah, you could be doing all of this without the assassins. Clearly, you can because you kill Latouche without any assassin involvement at all. You just go and stab his ass. So why are the assassins even present in the game at all? And and, and it's not like <laughs> they help him or he helps them. Like they don't even care about his revenge quest. They're just like, hey. If he wants to kill Templars, <laughs> let him kill Templars. <laughs> Dude, and that speaks to, like, the best line of the game because because <laughs> he's fucking like, this is why I joined the Brotherhood. And so that fuck, some fuck face is like, yeah, not n- not because you believe in our cause, but for revenge. And it's like, yeah, you motherfucker. You need to be you're like, yes, yeah, listen to him. That's completely right. Listen to him. <laughs> he, he's, he's accurate. See, I think Arno just really wanted to belong. I think he really wanted to belong. And so when the... When the opportunity came up to um, to join the assassins or to join the Brotherhood, he was like, "Hey, look, I get I get to belong to something." I do not think that he wanted to belong because immediately about hearing about the assassins, he's like, "Okay, well, your cult sounds like a fine bunch, but no, thank you." But as soon as Belek is like, "Well, hey, how are you going to save Elise without skills?" Then he joins on. He he doesn't want to belong to them, so it's not like he's like. Oh, wait a second. My dad was an assassin and you're one too and you're asking me to join? Hell yes, I, I'll join you. Yes, please. I need purpose. No, he he just, he does it because, well, I guess if I can learn how to stab people, then I can go and save Elise. Yeah, but he doesn't, he doesn't join then. He doesn't join them. And it's not until after he escapes the Bastille and he goes to Elise and Elise again is like, get away from me. I'm not going to deal with you. And again, he's feeling sorry for himself. And he's drinking a bottle outside of the the Saint-Chapelle. And then he finds the sanctuary. I think you are right to to a certain extent, Wolfie. Like, I think what what you're observing of, like, abandonment issues and, like, feeling a need to belong, there's an argument to be made that that's subtextually there. I just don't feel like it actually makes sense as the motivator behind the actions that he takes in the story. Like, I don't think it's consistent that, that every choice he makes or whatever is like out of a sense of belonging, because I think there are a number of choices that don't line up with that motivation at all. And a number of alternate motivations that could just as easily explain some of the choices that do line up with it. So like, I think there's, there's a worthwhile question to ask, which is like, I think I, I find Arno to be like, he's very likably acted. He's very like, you know, he has a, a great character design. How much of the character that you or, or anyone else would associate with Arno is actually there in the text versus how much of it can we kind of connect dots ourselves and, and, and how much credit can we really give the writers for creating a character that so many of those things that we might consider to be foundational attributes of the character aren't present in the story. They're things we have to kind of connect ourselves, I feel like. Things we perceive ourselves. Right. Things we perceive to be. I I don't know. I just, I, again. I'm not like trying I to said, put you I, on blast. I, I, I'm just trying to explain no, where I'm no. coming from, you know? No, I, I, I do see a lot of what you're saying. I mean, the, the story definitely is lacking. <laughs> It, it could have been told a lot better. Um, plus, too, a lot of people say that the whole 
there's not enough of the French Revolution yeah. um, portrayed in, in the story. Yeah. And honestly, I'm, I'm kind of glad for that. <laughs> After the bender scene, <laughs> when he and Elise go back and they're trying to discredit Robespierre, and then the whole thing with them trying to find Robespierre so they can get to Germain, that part is boring to me. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't like the whole thing, the, the whole scene where they're trying to, like I said, they're trying to, to, to discredit him. Yeah. And yeah, the, the, the narrative is all over the place. Yeah. You've got the political, you've got the internal strife between the assassins right. and the Templars, and you've got the love story with, with Arno mm-hmm. and Elise. There's, there's, like you said, there's, I think you said it earlier. It's kind of like a Frankenstein story. Yeah. It's too many pieces yeah. put together. Yeah. And I want to say one more thing about that Arno and Elise thing, and then we can move on from the Arno abandonment issues discussion. <laughs> I fine. just, I wanted to add, you know, and not to backtrack too much, but yes, Arno gets rejected by Elise, and then he's like, he, he's probably feeling a little low, and that's why he just decides to to go to the assassins. He's, he's even just drinking alone on a rooftop so yeah he's he's feeling pretty low and that's why he 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 gives it a shot i what i will challenge on is it's not just that because elise rejected him and now he feels lost it's more of that oh darn elise thinks i'm responsible how can i make this up to her and that's why he goes to the assassins he even says in that moment is that a fancy way of saying i need your help because he's not he's not seeking out the assassins because he wants to become one now. He's seeking them out because they might have the no. means to where he can avenge Elise's father and hopefully recapture her affection. Right. And at one point they even ask him, you know, are you doing this for revenge? And he's like, no, I'm doing this for redemption. He he's trying to get back in in the good graces of Elise. Yeah, there is that guilt so. element of like. Yes. I was late with the letter, and now he's dead, and I need to atone for that. That That is part of it, for yeah. sure. Can we talk about Balek? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to talk about Balek because he's he's the best thing in this game. <laughs> and that's not saying much. <laughs> do you like do you no, like, I like Balek, Balek too. He's great. Okay. He's he's really well acted, and he's, he's a fun Very character. Very well acted. It's just, why the fuck does he end every single sentence with piss pot? I don't like it it's just grating at a certain point stop saying piss pot it's not that funny it's not that funny ubisoft it's just the word piss pot <laughs> jesus fucking christ they're like oh my god huh, what if he said piss pot <laughs> <laughs> jesus christ sorry continue balak he's great yeah wolfie what, what do you how, how do you feel about balak um i i like him to a degree i when they're having the the confrontation up on up on the rooftop and he's sitting here naming off all of these all of these past experiences on how they had to tear down the brotherhood in order to build it back up again um i don't yeah. agree with all of these examples he was kind of wrong <laughs> nope monre gioni Ezio did not stab his dad and rebuild the fucking order in italy that's not what happened <laughs> nope <laughs> No, <laughs> it's it's weird. It's weird, Wolfie, because because in the line, it's it's honestly just poor writing because in the line, he's like, do you think this is the first time that the assassins have had to purge their leadership? And then he says, do you think this is the first time that the assassins have, have built themselves up, back up from nothing? So his first example of Levantine is is accurate for purging leadership. But then the rest of his examples are all about bringing the order back up from the ashes. And so it's poor writing because yeah. Yeah. you would think that his examples include two separate both things. of those things, yeah. but they they don't. <laughs> yeah, it's two separate. It's two separate things. <laughs> yeah, it's that's no, a good I li- point. I like Balak. Yeah, Balak is a good character, and you're right; he's well acted. I, I, I want to highlight part of why I feel like the Unity intro is is so striking to me. I I love so much, and and it speaks to how well acted the character is. But I love so much when Balak uh, is like chastising Arno because of the leap of faith. You know, he's like, this is the purview of every assassin boy. And I, I love that. I, I love it because like the music and the, and the atmosphere and like the, the urgency of that scene is, is so well done. And I feel like, yes, I need to jump off this building. And what I, but here's the thing I love about the line, <laughs> dude, unity makes me feel like I need to jump off a building. <laughs> so here's what I love about the line. Ultimately is it's not that he's mad at Arno because 
He is worried about the jump. He's mad at Arno because of his attitude about it. So like he's not like if Arno was like, wow, okay, this is a hard jump. I don't know if I'm going to, you know, I I don't know how I'm going to do this. It's different than saying it's impossible because yeah. the leap of faith isn't so much about having the strength or precision to pull it off. It's about having the willingness to do it. Because Arno is so unwilling to do it in that moment, that's why he gets upset. And then he works up the courage and he does it. It's great. If only the rest of the game was like yeah. that. <laughs> I also want to say, while, while, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this complaint because it's been made many times, but this game, part of the reason I disagree with liking everything up to the title card is that like, it's a very redundant introduction. There, there are like three different beginnings to the story. Essentially there's, there's the whole intro sequence in the, in the medieval times. There's, there's Arno then like, you know, doing his thing, you know, with the, he's getting the watch from the two thugs and he's trying to deliver a letter and failing. And then there's breaking out of the Bastille and all these three moments feel like they could be the start of the game. And I, w- I don't know why they aren't like this game could have started in the Bastille for all it would matter in terms of like giving you a reason to actually do the tutorials and stuff. Like there are like th- three combat tutorials in this game that like it just feels like people weren't communicating with each other yeah. when they were setting. I it agree. Up. I, don't, I agree. I don't know what's up with that. I have one nitpick yeah. about that leap of faith. Ooh. It could have been so much more impactful. It could have meant so much more if they hadn't allowed us yeah. or allowed Arno to do it off of the church yeah. when he's looking for the carriage. Which is great because you have controlled descent. So it's not like you're fucked if you get to a high point. Right. Like if you just couldn't exactly. do a leap of faith, then congratulations. You have to control descent your way until you acquire that skill from Belek. So it's like, I don't know why they didn't do 100%. it. 100%. Up there at the top of the church, you actually get the prompt to do the leap of faith, yeah. not the controlled descent yeah, to I get agree. down. Exactly. I agree. Uh, it would have been nice if we had gotten to the top and then Dan Janot was like, yeah, I didn't think this one through. And then they just controlled descent. Like, that'd be awesome. It'd be great. Yeah. Oh, I was going to have one more thing to say about story, uh, which is that Germain sucks as a villain because... <laughs> I, I was trying really hard on this playthrough to like pay close attention to like what he actually wants, like what his motivation is. He talks a lot about like, I'm I'm bringing Jacques de Molay's vision to life. And it just seems like he wants to control the world, I guess, or, or with banks, I think. I don't, I think he wants to, because I guess the Templars were, you know, in the de Molay times, they were, a, you know, they were kind of a banking service. Maybe he's thinking like the Templars will control the money and therefore control the world. Or like he just wants to just institute Templar world domination. I don't know. It's just it kind of sucks. It's shitty. I don't like it. And there's also not much connection between him being a sage and any of that. Like the, he talks about these visions. It almost feels like shouldn't it have more to do with Aita and with with that storyline whatever visions he's getting like why is he getting demolay visions is the implication that he's like a sage on a different level like with demolay and they're both sages of a different isu like I, I don't know i don't know what's going on there it doesn't make a lot of sense to me plus two the um at that in the beginning intro we're not playing as jacques demolay right we're playing as some nobody <laughs> guy who has to hide the sword and the codex <laughs> oh yeah yeah so we really don't have the connection between german and, and Demolay. Demolay. Yeah. So you just reminded me of something, Wolfie. It's so funny how Thomas Day is it, 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 it's it's like car it's Carnalon, right? Car- Carnalon. Carnion. Carnelion. Carnelion. Okay. Well, okay. You I have no idea. Like Carnelion. Uh it's funny how he's like clearly not able to get into the vault after the Templar guy locks it in. Like later in the game, Arno just walks up, turns it, and it's like, oh, it's open now. Cool, nice. And yet that one assassin couldn't figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> also how is the sword of eden factor into anything your mom wants to do because he has a he, because it's a sword he could use it <laughs> he's gonna be like time to she rebuild lightning. the banks with my <laughs> big ass sword. sword also guys i think the napoleon introduction is like one of the best scenes in any assassin's creed game ever Oh, that is such a good scene. Hundred percent, it is I love incredible. That scene. I really enjoyed the Napoleon. The subtlety, scene. same they wasted him on fucking dead kings. The subtlety of it, of like him reaching for his pistol when Arno suggests that they're after the same thing. The way that he opens up the apple yeah. of Eden behind, like out, out of sight. It's 
so fucking good. And you know what? That happens right after you kill Balak. That feels like a different game. Like, that's what I'm saying. It's a fucking Frankenstein. Yep. It feels like a different experience. Like, now all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm with Napoleon. It, and it's like, and it sucks because Napoleon has no relevance to the story. And that was something that you were saying before. I know you don't, I know, I know you're more in favor of this, but I think this game is so absent of the French Revolution history that I don't know what the fuck's going on ever. <laughs> <laughs> at any moment, at Me any neither. moment, I, I don't know. <laughs> like in, in Revelations, it's like a five minute thing and you completely understand why the Byzantines and the Ottomans are fighting, who they are, who they represent. And obviously it's it's a less complex issue than the French Revolution. But the French Revolution is so absent to this game that I don't like I have no context as to as to the world that I'm operating in. You know what I mean? It. It overcorrects yeah, the AC3 yeah. problem to where there's just no mention of history at all, really. It's like Arno and Elise are in the hot air balloon and they're like, wow, France, France is tearing itself apart. And it's like, uh, is it? I wouldn't know. I would like yeah. to know why. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of the side content, though. Um, yes, it's side content. <laughs> but if you do a lot of the side content, it does give you a little bit more of a feeling that there is a war going on yeah. the the various companion missions and the various um the little they're blue or gray with the assassin mm -hmm. logo missions on them i can't think of what the other the ones pair called. stories pair stories yes thank you yeah the those do tend to tie more into what's going on behind the scenes in 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 paris too bad they suck <laughs> <laughs> just kidding um, Even in like I don't I I haven't touched Unity's side content since launch because I hundred percented the game. Well, that's not true. I hundred percented it a few years later, like around when Origins was coming out, and I haven't touched it since then. So I don't remember a lot of it. But not a lot of it is especially memorable. There's a lot of side content, and most of it is just like go here, do this, grab a thing, come back, kill that guy. <laughs> yeah, it it feels very much crafted. It, it doesn't feel crafted in the world. It feels like they. They crafted the world and the mission. I did a murder mystery and I enjoyed it, but I, I I hated the way that they presented the information on my screen. I hated that. Like it was just, I hated the, I hate the whole like, oh, do your eagle pulse and then go find it. And then I'm going to put a big block on your screen with text. You can't read it. The, <laughs> the little pop-up box yes! pops up right yes! over God, yes! the description of what's happening. <laughs> Yes, yes. It's like, okay, well, I'm just going to fucking wait for my creed points to, to, to fucking spend. Like, Jesus Christ. Also, if they ever remaster Unity, please get rid of the creed points for every single action I do. Stop it. Yeah. Every single oh thing God. I do. Creed points. Hey, congratulations. You just crouched. Have 100 creed points. Yeah, it's like I, I kill a guy and it's like, whoa, did you just jump off a building in Assassin's Creed? <laughs> have some fucking creed points for it, bro. I also hate how you have to go to the database to, to look at all your evidence. It's 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 not fun. It's the I don't like the UI in this game very much, but but some of those murder mysteries are real puzzlers. They're fun, and like some of them are the most obvious things in the world. Like it's a 50-50 crapshoot whether you're gonna get a mission where it's like, hmm, the the butcher has a lot of you know human body parts in his thing. I wonder if he's the one who did it, or if it's gonna be like, you know. Oh, there are like five people who easily, equally could have done it. You have to find the one thing that sets one apart from the others. I have 100%ed Unity three times, I believe. Woof. Um, yes, I have. <laughs> I have played the murder mysteries. Like, I played them for real the first time through. Yeah. But after then, nope. I just, as soon as I find out who I can accuse, yep, that's the person. Wait, wait. So you can accuse <laughs> the wrong person and you don't fail the mission? 100%. Uh, you can accuse. Yeah, you can accuse the wrong you person. You can accuse all the wrong get... people before you get the right one and you'll still complete the mission. Well, okay. Yeah, you'll what still thought... complete the mission. I'm not sure if you get the What I thought you were reward. saying is that you can accuse the wrong person and the mission just ends. Uh, no. no. No, I think you're I think you're given other chances. Yeah. I just looked it up after the first time I did it. I, from then on, I just looked <laughs> up. Okay, yep, that's the person. Okay, yep. <laughs> you're it. Fuck a Nostradamus enigma. Have you done that shit three times? Yep. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yep. And the Helix Rifts as well. Oof. Oof. So are you wanting to talk more about gameplay now, Lawson? Yeah, I wanted to start by talking about the combat because I've always wanted to be a Unity combat apologist. Like, there's something about it I find satisfying 
on a basic level. And that I've often like defended like, Hey, unity combat is better than people give it credit for. But I, I do feel like I know more about game design now that I can say absolutely not. It's pretty terrible just because like, it's fun and satisfying to me when it's like one or two or three yeah. other enemies that I'm fighting. But when you're getting like gang banged by like 30 different <laughs> bad guys, there's like no way to deal with it. So you don't get the impression that like, oh, if I was just more skillful or I had better yes. gear, I could take on these 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 mobs. But it's just that like the actual basic systems don't scale well to multiple 100%. combatants. You you have like only a few actual tools in your roster as far as like things you can use during combat moves. You know, there's like technically a heavy attack, but you, you, you're you good luck using it. There's like staggering strike, I guess. But for the most part, it's just you got to you got to hit and you got to parry. And it gets really clunky, obviously, because of the animations. But when you have like the, the way the guns are designed, everything like that, it's just really fucking awful, especially because things that should happen instantly, like, say, I want to hit a smoke bomb or I want to dodge. That should happen instantly, but it wants to wait until you're done with whatever you'd already started doing in order for that to work. So, like, good luck dodging gunshots past a certain point. Good luck with with handling these crowds. There's something to be said for, I guess, that it incentivizes stealth because combat is so punishing yes. that you yes. you don't want to fight. So you run away and you, you come back stealthy. And that's fair. But I, I would contrast it with something like Ghost of Tsushima, where... Combat can be punishing and difficult, so you are encouraged to use stealth, but you never feel like getting out of a combat encounter would be impossible. You never feel like the game doesn't work with a certain number of combatants yeah. on, in yeah, play. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, in Hitman, in the more recent Hitman games where you, like, in just, a, in just a firefight, it's really hard, but if you're, like, using cover appropriately and, like, getting headshots and stuff like that, you can get out of a combat situation. And, and yeah, I completely agree with you. After a certain number of enemies, it gets really fucking just frustrating. I do like Unity Combat to a certain degree because I, I like how it's kind of based around fencing. I like how yeah. it looks in certain scenarios. It's very stylistic. It's yeah, very... yeah. It, it can be very cinematic at moments. And I yes, do, which is what I, I like do about like, it. you know, two to three guys. But when you get a fourth and a fifth, it's it, you know, it's almost impossible no matter what, what level you are. Well, that's not true, but it it can get really difficult. In fact, cinematic is a great word because that really sort of encapsulates what I love about Unity. Why I'm I'm so kind of right. torn as far as whether I love it or hate it is that the tone and the atmosphere of the game, the the vision for it is just so strong Beautiful. All across the board. Beautiful. You know, it's it's like you can almost see through the jank to visualize the game that they thought they were making or wanted to make, but didn't really achieve. And that game would maybe be like the best game in the series. It would be amazing because there's so much beautiful vision and, and, and just uniqueness in terms of the aesthetic, the mood, the tone, the presentation, the beautiful animations in, in terms of the cutscenes and the facial capture and, and just the cinematic feel. It just feels cinematic. I love that about this game. But yes, the janky gameplay just undermines it so significantly. I know that's kind of a harsh 90 degree from talking about the combat, but no, I yeah. wanted to get that in there because I was worried I wouldn't. <laughs> I mean, that's why I love the Unity prologue so much. Is it it's like it's like the opening to a movie. It's awesome. And the yeah. tone is so well well realized there. And and that's when Unity starts to fail, is when it loses sight of of some of that like execution on its tone throughout the game. It's not so much like Obviously, yeah. there's a lot of other issues, but like that Unity prologue, like it's not it's it's not great because of the writing, because there's not much story going on there. It's just it's all in the tone and atmosphere that it presents. Like seeing Jack D. Lim Jack D. Lim fuck Jack D. Lim oh my god Malay. Jesus Christ Jack D. Malay Jack <laughs> okay the I'm Malay. not gonna say it I'm not gonna say it seeing. Seeing the grandmaster, seeing the, the grandmaster Templar. Templar order being burned at the stake, like that's that's some cool shit. I, and like seeing the seeing the reflection in the king's eye, like that's in awesome. the eye. Oh, that is awesome. It's great. That is awesome. Oh yeah, I remember. I remember playing that, and like these are the best graphics I've ever seen. <laughs> they still they are. Still are. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that um, also. There's a lot of interesting parallels between this and Revelations, presumably because of the 
Alexandre Amancio, <laughs> however it's pronounced, Alexander Amancio uh, uh, influence. Just that, like, I remember commenting on Revelations that it feels like a blockbuster movie. Everything from the music to the set pieces, Revelations feels like an action blockbuster. Unity is very close to that. Unity almost hits that. Like, it, it, it sort of recreates the experience of watching, like, a modern adaptation of, like, The Three Musketeers or The Count of Monte Cristo, where it's like, just take this French Revolution imagery and put it in the context of a Hollywood action adventure movie. You know, there are a lot of set pieces in Unity that work really well towards achieving that. And the tone is spot on. Unity for me is the game that if if I'm going to just put on a game just to run around in, I can put on Unity and I'm happy for hours. I can just run around 100%. in that game and just, you know, view all the beautiful vistas and uh. it's the game I'm most likely to if I just need to like if I'm just going to run around in a game, I'm running around in Unity nine times out of ten. So it gets like booted up on my machine like at least once a year so that I can just run around Paris and have a good time. More so than any other Assassin's Creed game by far. The interiors, for example, are just, I mean, I, I say oh. this on Reddit or whatever mm. all the time. It's just pure eye candy. You've got yeah. beautiful tapestries and chandeliers and marble floors. And, and you can go into all of these buildings and just... Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. The interiors really add to making Paris feel like a living city. Yeah. Yeah. And and the crowds. The, <laughs> the fact crowds. that you can just like be running and, you know, every I think it's one out of, out of every four buildings you can enter. And so just the fact that you can be running and pretty consistently, you could just make a hard like, you know, a hard right turn and you could probably land into a building somewhere like that's <laughs> cool. I like that a lot. And yeah. it really takes advantage of that when you're going from like rooftop to down into a building on the second floor and then running out the other end. It, it really works. And it's funny because I, I wanted to perhaps feel differently. I, I don't like Paris. In the game or? In the game. <laughs> I'm okay with I love Paris. I love that. I, I literally had an experience once where like I accepted a mission and the place I needed to go was 800 meters away. And I just... You just was ran. able to stay on rooftop for the entire 800 yeah. meters. Yeah. Like that. I can't say the same thing about any other Assassin's Creed game, really. A lot of people, when they say, you know, what game has the best parkour or the best, you know, free running, it's Unity. Yeah. Well, that's not correct. But <laughs> for me, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, look, if you're going to say that you have the most fun. In Unity, that's that's fine. No, Unity has the best parkour. We don't have to get into it, but it is a fact. <laughs> Not even a little bit, but okay. <laughs> you know, it's funny because there are parts of Paris that I genuinely think are like amazing looking and beautiful, like really well-crafted open world. And I like how dense it is. I, I like how dense yeah. it is and how you can always stay on buildings and whatnot. I just, there's something about it that I, like the Notre Dame being like the centerpiece of the whole city, Beautiful, amazing. Yes, and beautiful. The fact that that one building is so huge and climbable, and you can go inside of it, and it's amazing. It's it's awesome. I just there's something about a lot of the city that I just I don't love, and I, I'm not I'm not saying that's bad or anything. You know, I, I, if, if people <laughs> think Paris is the best Assassin's Creed city, I'm totally okay with that assessment. I just something about it that I don't like. I don't know what it is. I can't help you there. <laughs> If you don't know what it is, I can't tell you why you're wrong it, about it. So I can't. It's like there are, there are parts about it that I love. And, and like I love climbing the Notre Dame and stuff. It's just there's maybe I don't know. I, I, I haven't yet put my finger on. It. I was trying to in this playthrough. I just there's something about it that I don't love exploring. I don't know. It's weird. The stained glass windows. Oh, in, beautiful. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Yeah, they really they really crafted this world very well. Yeah, the, very, the stained well. glass budget on this game must have been incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember reading somewhere uh, that the the rose the rose windows in Notre Dame are copyrighted, so they couldn't exactly duplicate it 100%. Wow. Oh, wow. So they had to create their own stained glass windows wow, for Notre Dame. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. You know what's not awesome in this game? <laughs> Stealth. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, yeah. stealth. Yeah. What is up with that cover system? I know, it's My too guys. sticky. He's what is that? <laughs> yeah, the cover system is not, not good. 
not good. Someone needs to take that cover system out behind the barn and grab a shotgun and just fucking put it out of its misery. I swear to God. I do like the fact that I think this was the first game that we had a dedicated crouch button. Pretty sure this was the yeah. first one. I do like that. And a lot of times I would do that instead of covering or at least when I had to yeah. cover around a, a door. It, just, it was fine. janky because it didn't seem to, it seemed like the cover status was more important to breaking line of sight. So I could be crouching behind something and still get spotted. But if I then am covered to that thing, I wouldn't get spotted, which feels weird because what is effectively the visual difference between me crouching behind something and, you know, sticking to it in the cover system? <laughs> Not much. Doesn't explain why I'm being seen now. So it's like just part of the jank and redundancy <laughs> there. I was going to say, why didn't they let Arno whistle? Ugh. Arno knows. Yeah. Arno knows how to what whistle. The fuck? He knows how to whistle. We see him whistle when he's viewing the journal from La F La Frenier's yeah, journal. Yeah, he's like in La Hall. <laughs> Whatever they were yes. planning. Yes. Arno knows how to whistle. So why can't he whistle when he's Imagine hiding in the, the reason stack? there's no whistle is because Dan Janot just didn't know how to whistle. <laughs> 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 he's like, well, we wanted to put it in this game, but uh, we wanted to stay authentic to, to Dan as a person. Yeah, it's like, how about you throw a really inconsistent cherry bomb? <laughs> yeah, and fuck the cherry bomb. I think they wanted us to lure people with the whole line of sight thing. Like, oh, switch between the cover and then they have to follow your silhouette. But they, it's like never predictable enough to actually reliably control. The here's game. another. It's just here's another ridiculous part about the cover system itself is that the cover kills are not like are, aren't invisible. If you think back to yeah. bush, like to, to, to foliage kills and, and black flag, they're always invisible and blended. And and perhaps that's like not super realistic, or whatever. But you need those kind of leniences to enjoy the stealth system. Yeah. I can't take advantage of the stealth system in Unity because none of it makes me invisible. It's and it's 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 a little too harsh and unforgiving. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And ironically, if the stealth was like flawless, then it would almost be okay that the combat sucks as bad as it does. Right. But because the stealth is equally janky, it just feels like the game does not right. work. And and I and I go back to Black Flag because it's it's it has such great stealth, and a lot of that is because it gives you very clear rules to to follow and. Yes. You, but but it gives you a lot of room to play and to take advantage of those and have fun. Lawson, did Tim yeah. did Tim just acknowledge something good in Black Flag? Did 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 I hear him say <laughs> Tim likes Black Flag. He just doesn't think it's the best one. <laughs> well, the more people praise it, the less I like it. I was gonna say. <laughs> No, I, <laughs> yeah, you I think it, I think fuck. has no, it just I, I I love the stealth and I just have I just have an issue with like it being like the like one like an ultimate Assassin's Creed experience. I don't think it is. But <laughs> this isn't the this isn't the 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 what did you say? The hook black pod flag. <laughs> yeah, it's like and so in this cover kills will always get you caught if if people are even looking in your direction. You're fucked. So it's it's yeah. like it's, yeah. that's not that's not that's not something I can take advantage of and have fun with. Or or the fucking double assassination only like yes. works thirty percent yes. of the time in my experience. It. Like how many times I've tried to do an air assassinate even with two targets highlighted just to watch Arno's dumbass kill one <laughs> and get but like, not the spear other. fucked by the other. Yeah. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, or when the objective is you need three cover kills and it's like, okay, now I'm seen and I'm gonna have to run and hide again because I can't I can't <laughs> I can't do any more. <laughs> it really all adds to this sense that like the moment to moment gameplay of Unity just doesn't work. Like it's just not functional most of the time. And that's like the biggest problem with the game, really. Yeah. But like we've said, if you learn to speak the language yes. of the jank, if you learn you can, to control you can kind it. of have a good yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it's <laughs> it's you know, it's worthwhile to look at like where stealth has been good in these games because Lawson, it's kind of like um uh, I think a uh, game maker's toolkit. They did yeah. a video uh, and they were talking about like they, they, they mentioned how in Uncharted when you come out of cover for like a few seconds, you're invincible. You can't be shot. And that is an important lenience yeah. to where, you know, it allows you to feel powerful and allows you to actually kill some people from using the cover system effectively. There needs mm -hmm. there, there, there's like none of that in Unity. They want you to have a terrible time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I mean. 
Like, and AC is no stranger to those kinds of subtle, like tweaks and leniences. Like, you know, how often do you look at a room and all of the guards are like helpfully looking away right. from your direction, yeah. you know, like, or, or consider how like classic Assassin's Creed fashion, when you're using courtesans to distract guards, it completely blinds them to you, you know? And yeah. it's like, and when, and when Valhalla does it and you lure a drunk to some guards, they can still see you. It's like, come on, like, give me some leniency, please. You know what I mean? <laughs> Learn lessons from the past when these games were good. <laughs> I also, uh, Lawson, this is this is a point that you made, and and uh, you know I was feeling this especially on, on my playthrough to where I just stopped buying things because I couldn't afford it because I can't play co-op and I can't make any money. <laughs> the economy got thrown out of whack. Like I feel like the existence of co-op really like looms over this game in an unpleasant way in a lot of facets from the, like those co-op skills that are useless to, you know, the, the customization system that's a little overboard to yeah, the economy being fucking broken. I spent most of the game not being able to so much as like refill consumables. And it feels really strange when like, you can do, you know, your average side mission. Your average side mission is going to get you like 400 francs and it's going to cost you like at a minimum 2000 to refill your consumables as much as 5000 once you get certain upgrades to the point where, yeah, later on you've got fucking iron skin or whatever. You're going to be having to spend 125,000 francs to just refill consumables. That's before buying any gear. If you want to fucking actually buy any of the like highest tier five gold diamond gear in this game you're probably going to have to like just sit in front of your community, ch your, your chest at the cafe Teatra and just literally like set 30 minute timers for yourself. So you can come back and pick up all the shit because that's the only way you're going to make enough money to buy anything worth a shit. If you play the game, including if, if you just do the main story, yes, it's, it's hard, but if you play the game with all of the side content, it's a lot easier. If you do all of the companion missions, I did missions, do the cafe theater missions just to get enough like capital to you know afford medicine but it just felt like i was playing american economy simulator yeah. i just couldn't <laughs> yeah, do anything it's like the social club missions too the, why, why don't the main missions just reward you with money <laughs> that, like, ac2 more ac2 money. did that like come on there's also, I had to rely on some of the gear pieces that they just give you yeah. as a reward in missions. And they're some of the ugliest ones and they don't go together at all. Like if you just gave me the equivalent amount of francs that I could use to buy my gear of choice, then I can still actually enjoy the customization system you care so much about. Put on an outfit to cover up the ugly. Yeah, yeah but all the, the outfits, outfits suck. suck. <laughs> <laughs> until, you, until you unlock the Master Assassin outfit, you are fucked outfit wise. Because Edward, <laughs> yeah, all the legacy outfits eat my ass. I, I would have loved, okay, so here's the thing. As a compromise, <laughs> I would have loved that there was just an outfit that was the default robes. Because yes, yes. Those, yeah. thank you. Because those also, I think Arno's default robes is like the best assassin outfit. The best default assassin outfit of all time. Exactly. It is, you don't, you it is don't amazing. Like the fearless, you don't like the fearless, Tim, right? It sucks. Fuck Aww. the fearless outfit. It sucks. It sucks. I hate the fearless outfit. I, but <laughs> uh, Wolf and I are both solidly, firmly on the team. Yes. McFarlane outfit, which you don't yeah. like. Yes. I love the McFarlane yeah. outfit. If that was Arno's <laughs> default outfit, it would also be the best default outfit that any assassins ever had. Yeah. I. It, it's it's interesting, too. I was I was talking with uh, Jaster's Hobbs. And he was, and he, he he made a good point about how like Arno's outfit kind of reinvents what assassin colors can be. Yeah, because usually it's like just like kind of white and red, and, and maybe a little blue. But Arno is literally walking around with the uh, f with the France flag on his on his body and <laughs> red, white, and blue. Yeah. It looks great. I love it. I, I love the name. Also, by the way, the moments that I loved playing this game the most is when I was just like walking w as Arno in the default robes because there's just something about the way that they. They they shape on his body. It just look. He just mm. looks like the perfect assassin. You know what I mean? Like he just looks so awesome. Yeah. Like like when I'm on a fucking rooftop and I and I and, and like the default robes are kind of like you know like moving around with my with my with my legs and I've got the the the, the smoke coming out of the chimneys around me. It's like amazing. So I guess to summarize, you know, me personally, Unity is kind of a complicated game for me because 
it was like it really was in my opinion the the highest p- point of potential in the franchise that we've had like like not just that this game had such high potential which it did but also that like i had all of this hope that the next games that would come after it would like really focus that potential and like deliver on it which they pretty much roundly have not uh so it's like it's the point in the series at which i was the most passionate about assassin's creed and i was just so nostalgic for that time and i really loved the time that i spent playing unity when it came out even despite all the jank i had fun with the co-op missions i had a little co-op group i uh you know i had a good time there's so much i love about unity that maybe it doesn't deserve and there's also so much i hate about unity that it totally does so it can't rank super high on my list which it doesn't but i can't put it at the bottom because there's just too much gold there's too much like beautiful beautiful shit in in unity that works really well so it's tough i i i love it i hate it it loves me it hates me it's unity that's all i can say (laughs) it definitely needed some more time to uh to polish up things and if 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 ever they were to do a um remaster of it or yeah just to clean things up fix up the combat, fix up the gameplay, fix up the the jank would be a whole lot better. I used to be very anti unity remaster, but this re- this replay brought me around to thinking that even if it can't look much better graphically than it already does, giving it the like gameplay. like, you know, the kind of quality of life gameplay improvements that AC3 remaster got could be a huge dub. Yeah, I I guess I mean to summarize like I think my biggest issue obviously is a lot of jank and one more year in the oven and it would have been the best AC game ever. I agree with you that like there's like in a post like you know classic AC world this is this is where we could have went. But my 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 biggest issue ultimately I feel like like if the story was good I could I, I could ignore a lot of these things. I just feel like it's kind of lazy from a writing perspective when you're doing an Assassin's Creed story to have a Templar and an assassin character who are in love and to do everything you can to avoid them having these like ideological discussions that are, you know, that are going to challenge them and make them actually have to have some conflict that, that sucks. And I, and I don't like that, but there is a lot, you know, there, there, there is, there's some good there. I think I, I dislike unity the most out of all of us, but there is some like hints of, of what, of what could have been a good game. And so I do appreciate it on that level. <laughs> Uh, for me, I I still, I, I guess I just look past all the the jank, and I can look past all of the the issues with you know combat or whatever because I've learned how to control Unity. Yeah, I don't let it control me. You speak the language of the jank. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I adore Arno. I really feel happy when i play when i play unity this playthrough for example i still 100 percented all of the missions i didn't 100 percent the game I, I barely even touched much of the the, the side content um, but i still 100 percented all the missions because i know how to i i can get through them relatively quickly and i think this playthrough the only one i really had issues with was the um was the fight with balek <laughs> the when we're in the saint chapelle and he would smoke bomb oof I can't tell you how many times are I got desynced. Yeah, that fight is broken <laughs> for many many reasons. Yes. <laughs> I didn't have any issue with that at all. That's so. interesting. Yeah. I had the random weird desync where like you're supposed to dodge him but it actually just makes you like stand completely straight in one place yes. and then he just And he just he just jumped on me he just or jumps whatever. On you and so. kills you. Yeah. And I also had the button so. prompt problem where there's like one button prompt where even though it doesn't visually communicate this at all, you actually have to tap the button like twice as fast. And if you don't, yes. you fail the button prompt yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah, I've had that in the past, but I didn't have it this playthrough. Me, I did. So <laughs> I just, yeah, go, going playing the game again, I'm still finding myself, oh, I love this game or, oh, I really like this part or I really, you know, can't wait till I get to whatever. So I, I just enjoy unity so much. I guess that about does it for this conversation about Assassin's Creed unity wolf. Thank you so much for joining us again. It's always fun and delightful to have wolf on the show. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate it. I have a lot of fun with you guys. I've been a long time 
listener uh, <laughs> to Hookblade. This is episode number 30. Yeah. I'm so proud of you guys. The big three up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thank you both so much for having me back. And thank you, dear listener, for listening to the Hookblade podcast. If you enjoy the show, there are a number of ways you can support us. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Hookblade. Like us on Facebook, uh, which we're just the Hookblade podcast. You can use the search, figure it out. You're smart. And, you know, leave us a like, leave us a comment. Tell us what you think about Unity all of these years later, so many years later. Is it the best Assassin's Creed game or the worst Assassin's Creed game? Those are the only two options you can choose. Uh, nothing in between. <laughs> so tell us what you think. That about does it. I've been the hook. And I've been the blade. And I'm the elegant design. And we will see you on the next episode. Yeah, but they are, but they are.